know, what I was telling you guys is that it's, we, we talk about brain death before, right? And that's cool when we talk about somebody else and it's, it's just an artificial idea that just crosses our mind. But 20 years ago, when I was just thinking about studying consciousness, I received a phone call. It was my mom. The partner of my sister was in the hospital. So I rushed there and I heard the diagnosis. And he was actually brain dead. Well, so you have to say goodbye, right? Um, so I go there and I touch him. And he was really, you know, warm. And as I said goodbye, he moves. It was weird, you know, it wasn't really normal, but he really moves. And I couldn't stop but thinking like, oh my gosh, is he there? What if? Well, you know, you trust the doctors because that's the only thing you can actually do, right? Um, and then that night, I just relived the experiment, the, this, this, this moment again. I'm a lucid dreamer, so I said, okay, now this is my chance to change the fate. So I wrestled with my thoughts, I changed you know, the end, and I win. And I feel like, oh my gosh, I am there. I am really there. But now the question to you is, how do you know who of us was there? In my dream, I am completely paralyzed, not moving an inch, but my mind is there, it's strong, right? But for you, who actually do you see? You see my brother-in-law, who is actually moving, but apparently there is no mind there. So that is the problem that we're trying to solve. How can we, from the outside, understand this mystery? And since then, that became my quest. So when David called me, I said, like, look, I'm going to do anything to understand this. Since 20 years, I'm probably until I'm dead. Um, and why I'm actually very interested in this is because we still don't know why this piece causes consciousness. Why my kid is or isn't consciousness, isn't conscious, you know? Or, you know, like, how do we know whether this thing here is conscious or not, you know? Or myself, right? Um, so when he called us, 18 months ago to say, like, well, let's just meet with these wonderful you know, people. I said, yes, I'll do it. You know why I'll do it? Because I was worried that we have all of these theories around and I had no way to tell who is winning. If I have to invest, how do you do it? You have to know, you know, like you have to make an informed decision. So I said, okay, well, let's eliminate theories, right? Let's just have these people, my, my mom and my dad, having a fight and see who of them wins. And hopefully, you know, like the one who wins is the one that actually made the best case. Uh, but that is not going to be enough. I mean, that's a, that's a piece of the puzzle. The next piece of the puzzle that I think is really going to help us is to get big data. And what do I mean by that? Science is in a terrible problem. Our data are shady, are shaky. You know, we don't even know what we're finding. So we need good and reliable data to drive trustworthy science. And also we need all of you guys because this is going to take a village. It's going to take all of the people who do AI, all of the neuroscientists, all of the people who do meditation to understand this puzzle. So let's just come together. And that, that is what I want to tell you today. So it started with these two wonderful individuals that I actually I love. You know, so don't, don't, don't think that I really want to, you know, you know I, I don't want to, you know, or that I want to just, you know, kill them. No, on the contrary. You know, like, I really, really, really love what they think, but they think very differently, you know? So you have Stanislav Dehan, who pushes for a global neural workspace, who's written wonderful books about it. You know, there's one, so I invite you to read it. But he thinks that consciousness is a form of computation. You have a broadcasting mechanism. And where does that happen in the brain? In one part, it's in the frontal cortex, somewhere around here. And it's just one of the pieces. Then you have Giulio Tononi, who actually thinks of consciousness as experience, right? And things that hope, you know, most likely the part that makes the difference is in the back of the brain. Also world famous with many books and so on and so forth, right? Well, so when we, when we met 18 months ago, the, the roadmap that we came uh, up with was, okay, let's do several stuff. First of all, let's just come up with good experiments that actually can arbitrate among these two theories, right? Because it's not enough to just, you know, build up evidence and evidence and evidence. You need to know who is right. And, but that's not going to be enough. The next thing that we need is to really throw the artillery of human neuroscience into the problem. So we're going to use 
fMRI, EMG, EEG, and, inclusive, and, and even electro electrocorticography. And I've, I have used all of those methods, and I can tell you that all of them tell us a little bit, but in combination, they tell us a lot. So this is gonna be the first time that we understand consciousness in this encompassing way. Uh, but the next problem is we need a lot of data because you know very often when I run my experiments I have like 20 you know 20 subjects in patients we have 10 patients I mean and come on you know we are actually very different like you know if I take any random person here you know like it's very difficult that we actually find the same patterns so we're going to do this in 500 people to make it reliable to, so that we can trust our data and then of course we need something that is standardized and common and this is where the problems and a lot of the complications comes about. So we need protocols that are standardized across all of these different sites. Um, and I thought, okay, that's gonna be enough, right? So if I have standardized, you know, well-powered studies, it's gonna be beautiful. And then I reminded myself that I also was trained as a clinical psychologist, and I really know of the power of the unconscious. So there's so many biases that we have there that is the only way that which I will really know if I replicate. So I will do it once, and I will do it twice, because the likelihood that I really get it right the first time and I will not trick myself is very little. So let's do it right. Let's just do it two, two times. And finally, I thought, okay, but I don't want to have these people that I still love being a part of you know, the people who collect the data, because again, the unconscious trickles down, right? So the, the likelihood that they attain the result by one way or another is not very minimal. So we actually rally a, a set of experts from outside the team who would do this experiment. And now let me show you who, this, these are the people. It wasn't difficult, it wasn't easy to put them all together and it took us 18 months, two babies, because it's two theories. Um, but we finally have it. And so by now we have the team, we have the responsibilities, we have the design of the experiment. Um, we have a set of tables that took us forever of passes and failures. And why? Because you know, if you really wanna eliminate a theory, you wanna go down to the specifics and say, okay, if this happens, you're wrong. And if this happens, you're right. Um, so that took us the longest time. We also decided to actually go outside to the world. What does that mean? So you heard from Megan about the typical things that we do in the, in the lab. Very much psychophysic, like we, we move some, you know, move, uh, you know uh, um, stimuli here, stimuli there, but you know, we live in this world that is complex. So we went all the way out and decided to, de to develop a video game that anyone can play where we can study consciousness in the real world. Um, and furthermore, we pre-register. What does that mean? Everything has a public record. Why? Because I trust my people, but so-so. So, you know, <laughs> so let's just have it, you know, like everything in written form, right? So then they cannot change their mind at any point. Or if they change, which is fine, there's gonna be a public record, so you will know. Um, and finally, David actually gave us the money. And we're gonna get, we're gonna launch this. Well, it took us forever to develop the experiments and et cetera, even the video game, which is still a, a lot of work. Um, but we're gonna launch in a week at the SFN. And in, in January, we're gonna start collecting data, and in three years' time, I'm gonna come here with the answer. Um, but I think that the real potential of this is on something that is beyond just trying to kill each other, which is coming together, right? So my real vision is that then, after this, exp this experiments, I will bring you all of this amazing data that we didn't have before. And I want every one of you, every one of your minds, to go into them and find patterns. Tell me what it is, because I still don't know. And this is just two theories. So the likelihood that they are right anyways is not very high. So let's just come from a, you know, more like data-driven perspective, and also from a, the a theory-driven perspective. So help me, help me finding my brain telescope, right? So now you can actually go into this data and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna only give you the data, we're gonna give you the protocols or the video game. And my biggest dream is that now we can actually deploy it to the internet and we can study people, not just 500, we can study em anyone, right? You know, in China, here, anywhere, right? And now we're gonna really understand what people at eight in the morning, you know, we are conscious of, and at 12 in the evening, and you know, when they are 30, 40, 50, and small, and big, and you know, when they are this nationality and that nationality, so now we can really do science at a scale. You know, not just 20 subjects, 30 subjects, 50 subjects. Um, so the problem is, is that what I have in mind takes a lot of effort. 
Uh, and one of those efforts is to be fair. What does, that, what does it mean to be fair? To share the data, you have to make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That's the jargon of data science. In essence, it means that you know, like they can be machine read and they can be understood. It's not that difficult, but, make, but making, meeting that challenge is actually fairly, fairly complicated. So what do we need? And this is where I want us to come as a village to solve this problem. I need something as simple as an electronic lab notebook that anyone can take and annotate things. You know, when you go to see a patient, when you go to see a, a student in the lab, you know, and, and that's what's going to allow us to have data where we know what's, what happened, when happened, what happened, everything. That's not going to be enough if we don't have annotated data and somehow shared ontology. So people need to, need to somehow say, okay, we think that this is a relevant information and this is a pattern that we can actually find. Um, we need to also be able to trace what data, what has happened to the data. That's the so-called like data provenance or data lineage. What, you know, what have we changed? We also need to have something like a Google on top of that, right? So now once you really have your data which are you know, freely available, they are annotated, you need to now have a search engine to go and mine those data and find exactly the patterns that actually are around there. And the last one is, of course, we need a lot of resources because if this needs to live in the cloud, well, you know, we need a lot of resources and computations, right? Um, but I think that if we really manage to solve this problem, which is non-trivial, but it's an important problem, we're going to be able to do science at a scale and understand the problems in a way that we haven't been able to understand. And our science is going to be better. It's going to be more credible, open, transparent, we're going to be able to inform policies and the public is going to trust us because things are not going to be shady. And if they are, you're going to know. Um, and it's also going to be cost effective. We don't need to duplicate the data. We don't need to you know, recreate the experiments. The data won't be lost. How many of you don't even know where the data lie? It's in some hard drive and you just don't know where they are. That is money that was lost. But at the end, what I hope is that with this we will really understand the mind as a whole and not just consciousness. So what is language? What is consciousness? What is attention and memory if we have all this? And so I want you to share my view of trying to build the so-called El Alma telescope for the brain. And what do I mean by this? If any one of us comes together by bringing our data and we can understand them, we will unravel the mysteries of the mind and maybe we will answer the question that still haunts me. Was he there? So thank you.